Does it do? Which one's yours? Okay, everybody settle down. You too, council member. Ooh, gotcha. <laughs> I'm not saying a word. We, we uh, all serve the city council. Uh, good evening to you all. Welcome back from a little break because of the way the schedule worked out. We ended up with a three week break, so. Uh, we're now down to the uh, final stretch. Two more classes tonight, and then two weeks from tonight, we'll wrap everything up. Uh, tonight, we get to do the fun part of the city. And uh, for those of you who think that police and streets are fun, more power to you. But tonight, I think these are two of the uh, best parts of the city because they're what changes a government into an actual community because these are the two areas that people look for when they move to a city, when they move to an area, they look at two of these particular areas. Um, I wanted to, Pam. What was, oh. Um, <clears throat> not until the fall, because we will do boards and commissions. So the question was uh, asking about boards and commissions, of course, which both of these areas have uh, their own board. Um, that process takes place in the fall, we will announce uh, probably sometime in August when the application progress uh, pro process opens and then we try to shoot for like October, November, does that sound about right? Um, to uh, have uh, applicants come to a council meeting for an interview and then the uh, appointment right after that. Did you have a question, Jim? You okay? Question? Okay. I thought you were going to raise your hand. Um, so yes, that's, that's coming. Absolutely, that's coming. And you're already on a list of folks that will be contacted when we're looking for, when we announce the application process because all of you folks may be interested in doing that and, and you should be part of that pool. Okay. <laughs> Come on, Pam. All right, uh, like I said, just uh, two more classes tonight and then uh, two weeks from tonight and then I will likely schedule, uh, I believe the second meeting in May, which I believe is the 18th of May as a uh, possible graduation night. And it'll likely be a double graduation since we never really got a chance to um, acknowledge the 2020 class. Because of course, remember, as I told you, the 2020 class ended up finishing in December. So we will likely do both uh, of those classes together. So kind of put that in the back of your mind as well. Uh, remember, that if you have not been to a council meeting, there's one next Tuesday, uh, seven o'clock in this room. Um, if you haven't been to a uh, planning and zoning meeting, the one that would have been this week was uh, canceled. So the next uh, one that's scheduled will be two two weeks, yeah, uh, from now. So we'll you know if you have not been to, just let me know and we'll we'll find you the uh, the dates for the next one. Okay, everybody ready? Um, as I said, we're going to start with uh, the first of the two really fun parts of the city and this particular area. Uh, has won too many awards for me to name, and it's two people that you're going to hear from tonight have been acknowledged throughout the land. And remember, I've been in a lot of cities and a lot of areas of this town, and I've been in this market, if you will, this greater Phoenix area for 30 years. 
these folks are rec you know, recognized as the best in their field in this entire city and throughout the state of Arizona. And they can you know, complain all they want about what I'm gonna say, but they are the best. They really are the best. Um, the director, we gonna start with you? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, has been with us for you know, literally her entire life because she started when she was in high school and she went to Apache Junction High School uh, and she's been the director for the last four years. Five years? Now well, there you go, five years. And uh, like I said, uh, you know, runs this tremendous department. They have uh, people, great, great people throughout their whole department and you're gonna learn all about it. So <clears throat> I introduce a graduate of Arizona State University. Uh, uh, and, uh, and a long time resident of Apache Junction. She's also a graduate of Apache Junction High School. I don't mind saying that, it's okay. Uh, but she is also, of course, the director of the Parks Department, Parks and Recreation Department for the city of Apache Junction. Ladies and gentlemen, Liz Langenbach. All right, well, thank you, Al, for that wonderful introduction. And thanks all of you who are involved with CLI. That is really the coolest thing. Uh, you know, giving up the time that you do to come and learn about the city government and the different departments that are here, it's so easy. And you know, I'm as guilty as anyone to kind of sit back and look at how things are done and think, you know, why do they do that? Or what a horrible way of doing something. Or I love these different things. We all have those different feelings. Um, but to actually come and get involved and learn a little bit about it and see the faces of the people um, that really do work hard to provide really great services to our community, just definitely uh, hats off or whatever off to all of you that are here tonight and giving up another evening of your lives. So uh, thanks for all being here. I'm actually going to have a pretty short part of it. You don't have to listen to me the whole time. I, have, I get to do a quick video of our park system. I'm going to just kind of introduce our Parks and Recreation Department, and we'll talk a little bit about the Parks Division, and then I'll be turning it over to Jamie Sullivan, who is my partner in crime. We've actually worked together our, almost our entire careers together here in Apache Junction. Um, I am just celebrated 26 years in March with the city, and very proud to be a part of this city, and um, happy from where, being, coming from where I came from. Uh, very excited to see how things have changed throughout this city and very proud to say that I'm an Apache Junction uh, resident and somebody went to school here in Apache Junction. I never, ever worry about sharing with people where I'm from because I am definitely very proud of it. And as Al was saying, across the state, our Parks and Rec departments, nobody would ever uh, question where Jamie and I are from. Nobody would ever tell us one single negative thing about our community just because they know better. And I really feel like uh, that's something that, that we take very seriously. So. Without any more on that, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. The first part, we just kind of want to share, this is odd for me, we're usually turned around. Um, the first part, we just kind of want to share a little bit about our organizational structure to give you an idea. Um, so we also have a Parks and Recreation Commission. They are an advisory board, and so as you guys were talking about commission applications, I hope that you will consider, um, as you look at commissions you might want to be a part of, uh, we generally have a couple of vacancies each year as people uh, phase through. Um, so we have an advisory committee that talks with us. They are a recommending body to the city council and they are appointed by the city council as the other parks or as the other commissions and boards are. In um, my division that I oversee directly, we have a couple of staff that are in our administrative. So they do all of the payroll and the accounts payable, receivable, all of the kind of more of the administrative functions. And then I also currently oversee the Parks Division. Um, we had a long time uh, staff member, Nick Blake, who was a landscape architect. He ran our Parks Division. He retired um, about a year and a half ago, and we miss him greatly. Um, but he had a wonder, he prepared a wonderful division, and so I oversee the admin and the park side. We have split our maintenance team into two teams. Uh, we have grown a lot over the years and we will continue to grow here shortly. So we have somebody that's in charge of the south side. South side right now is about everything on the other side of superstition. And um, north side is everything to the north of superstition plus our multi-use trail system. And then Jamie, she'll be sharing um, more about her division whenever she gets up. 
but Jamie oversees all of the recreation programs, facilities, and services, and again, she'll kind of share that a little bit more as we go. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, end the show just briefly. Is that how I have to do this? Okay, good. And you guys will get to just watch a little video that shares about the parks. You don't have to just listen. The Apache Junction Parks and Recreation Department had its beginning in 1980 with the hiring of Jeff Bell as its one and only. as well as over 2,000 acres of open space and trails, not one dime has been spent in the purchase of these properties. It has all been acquired through intergovernmental agreements with the Apache Junction School District and through long-term leases with the Bureau of Land Management. Many of the park facilities developed over the years have earned the city both state and national recognition. The city's initial focal point construction was completed in 1996. In 1997, the project won Arizona Main Street Award for Best Public Improvement. In that same year, the April edition of the nationally distributed Landscape Architect magazine contained a feature article on the focal point, complimenting the city for the project and portraying it in a very positive light. Superstition Shadows Park has received two major awards from state organizations. In 2004, the Arizona Parks and Recreation Association recognized the park with their award for most outstanding facility for a community with a population under 60,000. Additionally, in 2004, the Arizona Department of Commerce and the Governor's Office presented Apache Junction Parks and Recreation with their award for Excellence in Rural Development for Superstition Shadows Park. In 2008, the Parks and Recreation Department was honored by the Arizona Chapter of Landscape Architects who recognized us with their best Landscape Maintenance Practice Award for the high level of landscape maintenance performed on our City Hall campus. Within a year of its opening in October 2005, the Apache Junction Multi-Generational Center was acknowledged for two separate awards. Recreation Management Magazine recognized the center for their 2006 Innovative Architecture and Design Awards. Also that year, the Arizona Parks and Recreation Association awarded the center with their 2006 Outstanding Facility Award for populations 25,000 to 100,000. More recently, the AJ Multigenerational Center became U.S. Green Building Council LEED certified in 2010. In 2011, it was recognized as the best city rec center in the East Valley Tribune's Best of East Valley Awards. The Phoenix New Times honored our Lost Dutchman Days event and rodeo park. Standing planning and design, a critical component of Apache Junction Parks and Recreation operations. The Parks and Recreation Department has adopted a planning policy of concentrating on regionally sized parks allowing the developers and residential homeowners associations to build and maintain the smaller neighborhood parks. By concentrating on larger regional parks, we cut maintenance costs because it's more cost effective to maintain a larger facility than several small ones. It also allows us to plan and build for larger amenities such as ball fields, racquetball courts, tennis courts, swimming pools, and skate parks that relate directly to our own recreation programs and needs and that are typically too big for smaller parks. Parks such as Prospector Park and Superstition Shadows Park are prime examples of regional park development. With the current planning efforts being done for the large land area south of Highway 60, 
The Parks and Recreation Department has a vision for that area as it relates to the recreational, parks, open space, and trail needs of the community. One of the major goals we are encouraging to happen is the development of another regionally sized park to accommodate the needs of these future residents. We are also encouraging a linking trail system that will extend from the south end of the multi-use trail near Silly Mountain Park in a generally southwesterly direction to the CAP Canal. The CAP Canal right-of-way is a major trail feature of the Pinal County Trail Master Plan. This would then link all of the trail system of Apache Junction with those trails planned for all of Pinal County. While well, Apache Junction is not a large city and perhaps does not have all the recreational amenities we would like to see, those amenities we do have have been built on land that has been acquired at no cost to the taxpayers. The parks themselves have all been extremely well master planned, responding to the needs and wants of the community. Those master plans have been subsequently implemented into constructed amenities over the years by a staff that demands quality and has an eye for detail, rarely seen in municipal park development. An example of this is our aquatic center at Superstition Shadows Park. Due to the attention to detail in the design phase, this facility has a look and feel of a luxury resort more than it does a typical city swimming pool. The skate park at Superstition Shadows Park is a direct result of the Parks and Recreation Department listening to the requests of the youth of this community. These youth came out in large numbers to several public meetings and participated in design charrettes where they made known their specific desires regarding a skate park facility. These specific desires were later implemented directly into the ultimate design and construction of the facility. The youth of this city, through their active participation, got exactly the skate park they were hoping for. Additionally, they learned a lesson in civics on how their collective voices can be heard, resulting in a positive difference for the community. A similar process was utilized in the development of our Rodeo Event Center and Silly Mountain Park Master Plans. Listening and responding to a multitude of individual concerns expressed at several public meetings resulted in the development of the current master plans for both of these facilities. In early 2008, we completed construction of Phase 1 of the Rodeo Event Center Master Plan, which included a new restroom concession building and bleacher seating for over 2,000 spectators. Phase 4 of Prospector Park will provide an additional restroom and parking for the northeast portion of the park, as well as a long-awaited off-leash facility for the many dog lovers of the community. In 2017, the Parks and Recreation Department was excited to open their newest park facility and first event space in the downtown area, Flatiron Community Park. This is truly a park that the community built and was made possible by the generosity of our various community partners. In addition to the help of grants and scholarships from the local partner organizations, there was also a land exchange and development fee money that was already identified for future park projects that helped this vision become a reality. Apache Junction Parks have been unsurpassed by any other Valley community for excellence in overall maintenance. Our community is truly blessed to have such an incredible natural setting in the shadows of the Superstition Mountains. No one is more aware of that than our parks maintenance staff who put forth an amazing effort in keeping our park facilities looking as beautiful as our natural surroundings. Our staff has as much passion in the care for these facilities as And that voiceover was Nick Blake, our former park superintendent. It is, um, so we've been using that video these last few years. There are a few little updates that I just wanted to point out um, to all of us, and we'll kind of go from here. So I um, did want to talk just briefly about some of the current stuff that's going to be coming up. So a lot of the plans that Nick was explaining about ended kind of in about 2008. And as everybody is aware, that was kind of a time where the economy really took a downturn, especially here in Arizona, and Apache Junction was also hit. So we had a lot of master plans on the shelf, a lot of ideas of what we wanted to do, some 
Uh, two very big dog parks were planned for the Prospector Park area as well as Silly Mountain, and all of those were put on hold at that moment in time. Um, our former Parks and Rec director, uh, Jeff Bell, who was in the beginning of this slide, uh, really worked hard to make sure that we brought a lot of amenities to our community, and we're very fortunate to have what we have. Um, but as our community kept talking about a dog park, we knew we couldn't do the, all the bells and whistles $4 million park that was in our plan. But he started looking for other locations where there might be a good location to have a mid-sized, you know, something that was still a good, um, could be put to good purpose in our community. And so we paired up with the Arizona State University Capstone Group. Um, students came out, they identified many areas in the community. Jeff had already been talking with the county about the area that we currently uh, maintain drainage at right now, and I say that very loosely because the drainage area that uh, our future dog park will be in doesn't drain very well right now. Um, and so um, the ASU students looked around and looking to see with the type of money that we have, the space limitations, what could we do as their recommendations were to find an area where we could do something uh, short term that would be here, would be a great amenity, um, particularly in our downtown area, and then later as money came about that we could kind of grow that into something a little bit bigger, but to keep that momentum going and to go ahead and get something now. Um, the county retention basin, which is at the corner of Superstition and Idaho, you'll be able to see it whenever you drive he by here every day, there's a big retention basin there, a lot of trees, it's a great location that ha already has a lot of shade, is on um, property that, uh, again, we wouldn't really necessarily have to build, we partnered with the county. And so over the last couple of years, we had been talking with uh, city council, as well as our Parks and Recreation Commission, and that location was identified and selected as kind of our mid-level dog park. Um, I have up here on the slide here, just a, a quick conceptual drawing of it. We are actually in some of our final phases. So this had gone to council as well as our commission for the last couple of years. Uh, they selected the site and the design um, and we will be ready to go out for bid this month sometime. And so we are very excited that this, maybe this time next year, that our first dog park will be opening up here in our community. Um, it is, it, again, it's not kind of all the bells and whistles, but it still has three separate areas. If you actually go to that area, when you're down in that retention basin, it's actually a lot bigger than what you would think that it is. I think a lot of us thought, oh, that's not very big. When you're down there, it's actually a very uh, big space. So we'll have three separate gated areas. There's double gates for the entry, just like any other dog park that you would uh, see. And then we did some major retrofit to the drainage channel there, working with our city engineers as well as the design team. Um, we will be kind of taking that water that comes down here during our main, mainly our monsoon events and large rain events. I haven't had much of that in the last year, but we know that they'll be coming taking that around the park, so that way that water isn't always just sitting in that retention basin. It will still be a detention basin um, for a really large event. If there's overflow, um, it will still fill up with water, but on any normal rain event, that water is gonna actually flow around the dog park. So we're not necessarily having to close it um, every time it rains or, or any time we have issues. It will be regular um, grass, uh, overseeded grass, again, another good reason for the three separate areas. We are working with the Public Arts Commission right now on some locations for uh, public art that will be incorporated into the park, and so that will be exciting to see what um, they help us to come up with. As we said, we selected this area because there was already so many great mature trees, so there's already a lot of natural shade uh, for our dog park enthusiasts that end up coming out there. Some of the challenges that we're well aware of and really working hard to kind of mitigate parking. So this is in the city, in the county complex. Um, we did a lot of studies leading prior to COVID uh, where we kind of looked to see how is that parking lot utilized? What kinds of free space is there during the day? And in talking with county officials, we really felt like it, it will definitely be a concern and something we want to address but we thought it could still work. So there's still quite a bit of, and this is a good picture of what an average day might look like. Um, there are some really heavily used days at the county. I'm told Mondays, there might be one other day that is like a big court day. Those would end up being our maintenance days, so the park would actually be closed while they're the busiest. Um, 
And then, you know, our weekends, evenings, there will be very little parking there. We also have spillover parking over at the Veterans Memorial Park across the street. So those are some of the ways that we're looking at addressing um, this facility. So that's kind of, like I said, we'll be going out for bid here this month for the dog park. We are working with some um, other citizens as well that are helping us with some of our rules and our amenities that are gonna be done there, some of the fundraising events. This, just like any other, um, I'm sorry, just like our most recent park, Flatiron, uh, is gonna be virtually zero dollars of taxpayer money to, um, to construct it. So we have development fee money that has been coming in that we'll be able to use for this, as well as a little bit of sponsorship money. We'll be doing sponsorships as well as some grants that will contribute to it. We're hoping it's gonna come out in about 900,000 to a million dollars. It sounds like a lot of money for just grass and uh, fencing, but keep in mind, this is a two for one project here. We are, re, uh, we are changing uh, our retention making sure that this is an area that drains properly and adds to our overall drainage solutions in our city versus uh, problems. So um, we're really excited about it and we're hoping that this time next year we'll, we'll definitely be opening that to the community. That's pretty much what I have um, for the Parks Division. If you have any questions for me and then after we're done, we'll turn it over to the next part of our group. Questions right now? All right, you guys are super easy. But be thinking, and if you have questions after, am I introducing Jamie or you? So I will just quickly introduce um, Jamie Sullivan is our recreation superintendent. And as I said before, um, we pretty much have grown up in the Parks and Rec Department together, uh, working and go going up through the, the chain of different jobs and, and worked in a lot of different areas in the division. I definitely couldn't do what I do without Jamie. Um, I, we're, I feel like we're a great team. We fight whenever we don't agree with each other, but uh, we definitely uh, support each other and have each other's backs. She has developed an amazing recreation division. She is also a sun devil, and so uh, we also have that in common, yes. Yeah, so I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie and, and let her kind of share a little bit more, and she'll talk on rec division. Okay, so uh, rec division, like she said, kind of all falls under me, but she's still the boss. So I get to make some decisions, but all the important ones, I try to remind her what I did. But uh, so under recreation, we have different coordinators who head out the different areas in recreation. So we have a sports coordinator, we have a senior services uh, coordinator, but in a small town, your coordinators do lots of things. So if you go to like a Mesa or a Phoenix, you might find somebody who all they do is senior services. Well, our coordinator for senior services also does youth programs. He also sits on very many coalition meetings. He's very well-rounded. Most of our coordinators are. Our aquatics coordinator is also oversees fitness. So um, we split her time. So I like to think we're very well-rounded and very well-versed. We also have rec assistants and we have some senior rec leaders. I am really proud of the fact that most of our full-time staff are all products of Apache Junction. They're either prospectors or Dutchmans or um, lumberjacks or devils. Um, so we're really proud that we have a lot of homegrown. A lot of us started. Um, we have uh, an Underwood and we've probably employed four out of his five kids at one time. So uh, we like to consider, we're kind of a family. So in recreation, we'll skip through parks because we already did that. So um, the multi-gen center is obviously not the newest thing in recreation, but it is the biggest thing in recreation. So we're going on 15 years old in the facility, other than a little bit of wear and tear. You can tell that it is a very loved facility it still is a number one top notch. We get people who come in all the time and surprised that we have such an amenity in such a small town. Um, there is, um, it can be membership based, so if you wanna work out, go to fitness classes, if you want to walk the indoor track because it's 110 degrees outside, 
There's daily fees, there's monthly fees, yearly fees. We have it broken down by youth and family and all that good stuff. But that's not the only thing. It's also our hub. Uh, the special interest classes are in there. We have karate classes. It's where you'd go to make a reservation for a ball field or for a ramada. Um, it's kind of where everything happens that's not outside plays. So, and... If you haven't been there, you should go there. Usually we do a tour after this, but we're modifying just like everything else. Fitness area classes, we have it all. We have yoga, we have tai chi, we have yoga. We, uh, I said yoga. So Liz, our director, um, she plays very well in everything. She took a laughter yoga class. And I really wish I could have been there just to watch her take the laughter yoga class because I'm pretty sure I would have been laughing on the outside of it. But um, we have a lot of ton fun classes. You can come try it out for $5. If, you, if laughter yoga isn't for you, then you just take another class the next day. So we have at one time, we had 30 different classes we were offering. Um, and we offer them six days a week all the way from first thing in the morning all the way to in the evening. So there's no excuse not to participate. John is one of our longtime members. I think he has been there as long as I have. Um, I got to help build that facility, so it was kind of cool. We have members that have still been with us. We, again, it's, we get lots of positive vibes that come out of that facility, and we're pretty proud of it. Uh, Max, who is age four in this photo, he's probably 24 now, so just so you know. Uh, most of our photos are, you know, pretty old, and you, you know, might be like, oh, that's my kid 20 years ago. He's 19, is that what you said? Oh, yeah, it was. Okay, so he's 19. He's 19. So starting with that, we do have an array of classes all the way from art classes to dance classes, tumbling classes, and for all age. We have parent talk classes, we have mommy and me classes, and then we have, um, you know, like in the evening classes, we'll have AARP. Well, no, they're not in the evening. We like to keep them driving during the day, but like the 55 and older classes. So we've offered those. Um, so we've had a, an array of classes. And if the community wants it, we try to find a way to bring it to them. So we have people who come in and be like, oh, I want to learn how to paint gourds. Do you have a gourd class? And I'm like, no, but let's put it out there and see if we get any takers. And we ask them to help. Do you know of anyone who teaches gourd classes? So if we get enough interest out there, we really like to listen. But sometimes people tell us they want things, but they, won't, they don't really want them. So they'll tell us they want more Saturday classes, and then we offer Saturday classes, and they don't show up because they didn't realize that they have all kinds of other things on Saturday. But I always say we're almost willing to try just about anything once. Um, usually it's like we try it like three times before we realize it's not going to work, but, you know, we keep trying. Senior services. So we have been offering senior programs for really long, for as long as I've worked here in some form or another. Um, but a couple years ago, it's probably more than a couple. It's probably like four now, but um, we took over the lunch program and the transportation program when the nonprofit who was running them no longer could. And so we have expanded our senior services program greatly. Um, we've been up and running. COVID has not slowed us down. In 2020, we served over 13,000 meals. Um, we went from in-person dining to drive-through dining. And we really thought our numbers were going to go down. But they didn't. They've been holding steady. Um, so we're really proud that we were able to take over these services. We also have the art and the bing bingo. We, we actually have a bingo license for real money, but it's quarters, so they're quarter cards. So when you win, you win like $2.75. But you, those bingo players, it's like they won $500. They don't care. It's more social than anything. And we have social bingo where they win like dish soap, and, and they think that's great too. So it's pretty amazing. Um, we have aquatics program. We do have open swim. We have swim lessons. We're super proud of our, our Learn to Swim program. It's super important for our community to make sure that our kiddos are out there. We do water safety. April Pools Day is actually coming up on the 17th of, uh, it's the Saturday, actually. Big, huge event where we get to showcase our pool. We get to talk about the things that we're going to be doing throughout the summer. 
um, and a whole lot of water safety takes place on that. We're able to pretty much scholarship anybody who can't afford a swim lesson. Um, money should never be a factor on learning life-saving skills, so we do have that afforded to those that live um, in our school district to be able to make sure they can get free swim lessons. And you can also rent that beautiful pool if you want to have a party for your family. So we'll take your money. We have school age programs, so we, we work closely with our school district, with Boys and Girls Club. Um, we're not a one-stop shop. We are not competitors. We want to make sure that everybody in our community, that we get to offer it all. So if you need you know, long-term you know, programming where it's super early in the morning to when you get off work, we have a Boys and Girls Club for that. If the school needs help working out or having some you know, cool science with Jake guy come in and, and entertain their kids after school, we help with that. If we need to have camps during the breaks, um, Parks and Rec fills in those gaps. But we all work really close in our community. It's not just Parks and Recreation that makes those things happen. We're really proud of our Youth Advisory Council. So these are kids in our high schools that form together to kind of learn about how government works and they kind of operate like a small city council within themselves. Uh, they helped name Flatiron Park. They were just out this last Saturday helping clean up the trails, um, getting rid of the garbage and stuff like that. They'll come up with their own service projects of things that they want to do in our community and then we help guide them through the process to make that work. We have sports programs. What kind of recreation department would you be if you didn't have sports programs? I'm really excited that we were able to offer a youth pickleball this last spring. We offered uh, two sessions. Both of them were full. So it's just not a baby boomer game. Um, our young kids are starting to play it, and they're starting to love it too. But we do have different seasons. Again, we work with our community, so we don't compete with Little League. We're not going to be doing a baseball season the same time, same time they are. We don't have enough kids to you know, try to compete. And we don't want our kids to have to choose or our families to have to choose. So we run basketball leagues during the summer. We do a lot of clinics. We work with the high school, their coaches, they come in, they run clinics. And in return, they get to take the registration fees and put that back into the high school teams. Uh, and adult sports, we have co those are kind of like the same as running kids sports. But so we have adult sports, we have co-ed um, softball. Super popular. We have pickleball leagues for our adults. We've had golf leagues um, also for our adults. Um, so we still need to recreate. Super important for us adults to get out there. My favorite thing of my job has always been special events. I have th that, that's just where I shined as an employee when I did special events and I was a coordinator. Um, my coordinators probably have a really hard time because I always have my hands in special events. But what I love about special events is no matter how big or how small, that, I mean, 4th of July is my favorite, you know? It could be 112 degrees, we work 12 hours, we have sweat pouring down us, and I am just out there with the biggest grin on my face because that's when you get to see all the fruits of your labor. You get to see all your community come out. I get to see kids who worked for me who now have, you know, their own kids are coming out. You get to see the vendors, the politicians might show up, you know, and everybody shakes hands and we play nice. But I love the special events in our community. And even during COVID, we did not give up on special events. We still had Easter it just looked different. Our Halloween drive through event, phenomenal. Like, just so great that now they want us to do both. They want us to do an in-person event and a drive through event. So I, I don't know. I think COVID is just going to make duplicate efforts. But um, so I think our special events are top notch for our community. My favorite, favorite thing to do. We bring snow in, um, 30 tons, is it 30 tons of snow? We bring in, those kids play in that snow well after we've told them it's time to go home, you need to leave, you know, they're still building snowmen. Um, facility reservations, so we do rent out facilities, uh, ramadas for birthday parties, you can rent out rooms at the multi-gen center, we do birthday parties at the multi-gen center, so instead of going and spending $400 at Chuck E. Cheese, you can come spend $150 right here in your own neighborhood. Um, and right now, with uh, we get a lot of questions about like the rodeo grounds because it is on BLM land. It is you can't rent it out for profit. So people say, well, when are you going to have a country thunder? 
or not right now or maybe never i don't know that's pretty big but we can't have for profits renting out our facilities some of our facilities at this time we are well all of them at this time we are working on changing that down the road so we can open that up for commercial businesses as well um, and you can tour any of our facilities so if you're thinking about renting call it up call us up we'll give you a tour and show you around Job opportunities. We need lifeguards, we need water safety instructors, we need rec staff. So, and this is all ages. I know that these pictures are young people here um, and that the majority of our part-time staff are young people, but we hire all ages. We have job openings right now. Um, we pride ourselves, again, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of the people that work for us stay with us. We see guards that have worked for us three, four years that we get to watch them grow up in the community and then grow out. And a lot of times they come back and we're pretty proud of that. I think we do a great job at preparing them for the real workforce, whether or not they make a career out of recreation and make their parents super proud, or if they go on to be doctors um, or nurses or police officers, whatever their passion may be, we're glad that they got their start here. I hear lots of times that as soon as people know where they're coming from, they know that they, you know, when other cities, just like, yeah, I hired one of your kids and I had no doubt because your reputation for producing amazing employees supersedes us. We do a really good job of floating our own boat, don't we? <laughs> About how great we are. When you've been here this long, though, that's, you know, exactly, right? I'm going to toot my own horn. I've been here long enough. If you want to work for free, we have opportunities for that as well. So we have an amazing junior guard program uh, that is actually full. So I don't know how we can get 45 kids who want to volunteer, but I can't get 45 who want to get paid. I don't understand, but you know, we're working on it. Um, we also have opportunities to work and volunteer in our senior services. We are hoping to bring back in-person dining come May. And so we usually have folks that will come in and volunteer to help serve, they help clean, they help set up. We have some that help volunteer to do art classes and they just say, we just wanna come and teach them how to you know, make cards or something like that. So we have a great uh, volunteer workforce. And then we use volunteers for one-time things like special events. So if you saw something here tonight that you're like, yeah, I wanna work out in 112 degrees and put that big old smile on my face, I got a, job. I got a volunteer position for you. Wow, look, we just end on a dark screen. <laughs> That's it, right there. Um, so we'll just leave it at that. Maybe it'll stick in your mind a little bit. But as you can tell, we're fun people. We enjoy what we do. I enjoy serving the community. I've always said, I have always said that um, my purpose is to be able to create the quality of life of my community through people, which is me and my workforce, through the programs that we offer, and through the places that we put out there, and that would be our parks and our multi-gen center. So, questions? Flow my, to my horn. Okay, hold on. Oh, it, we've got Oprah over here moving the, moving the mic. <laughs> we got the... <laughs> Phil Donahue. <laughs> we got... We got the booklets out for the three months already or not? We do. I actually have them in your bag that Al was supposed to hand out to you. So our summer citizen brochure is out. Yeah. That has all of our activities and programs in it. Um, you can look through it. We will have an abbreviated version that will come out in the independent uh, the first week in May. And we start registration for all of our summer programs on Saturday. And you get a bag, and you get a bag, and you get a bag. <laughs> I don't have a question. I just want to attest to their program. To my horn. Yes. Um, our daughter and our son-in-law, both, our daughter started as a junior guard, worked all through high school as a lifeguard. They also coached the summer swim team when they still had it. And they had, they still talk about Liz. <laughs> and what a phenomenal boss Liz was. And so their, their aquatics program is phenomenal. 
Yeah, and I mean, they're 30 and they still talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. That's pretty good. April Fool's Day, Saturday? April Fool's Day is Saturday. This year we did it a little bit different. It used to be uh, just, you know, bring everybody, show up, and we'd feed you, and, you know, we'd have 300 people out there. Times have changed a little bit, so we've taken registration where you can reservation, put in a reservation and you come at a certain time. We spend some time with you, getting you through water safety, getting the kids in the pool for a little bit so they can get wet. Um, our, our weather is super crazy. We've had April Pool's Day where those kids are shivering and they've got their jackets on. I think last year we decided to heat the pool at one point. It was so cold. And now this year we have, you know, it's perfect, you know, 90 degree weather um, to be able to have an April Pool's Day. So, yes, this weekend. The traditional kickoff to the aquatic season, if you will. Yeah, and <coughs> Memorial Day is our big weekend, so we will be having information come out the end of this month about what all of our pool hours are going to look like, and then we kick off uh, Memorial Day weekend. Okay, more questions. The most fabulous parks department in the land. Miss Sarah. We are. You talked about the senior programs and then bingo. Is bingo open for all ages? It is open for all ages, but it's done like at, you know, one o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So if that works for you, we are happy to have you, um, you know, come and participate. But our bingo license is only good from eight to five. So thank you. No, so again, COVID gave us some new opportunities to change some things. That's one of the things that didn't go over so well. So we tried to have bingo in the parking lot and the state said, yeah, you can do that. So we thought they'd come drive up in their cars and play bingo. Again, going back to that, it's really, they're really there for social reasons. Can't really socialize outside of your car and we really don't want them to. So we tried it for about six weeks. It served a purpose, but we're happy to get back to in person in May. So, Jamie, I just wanted to mention, is everybody here aware that we have a drive-in movie here in Apache Junction? Yes. Everybody knows that yeah. and makes use of it? You don't? You might want to mention So we that. have drive-in movies, but we are happy that come summertime we are going to be taking them back to our pool. So we do dive-in movies during the summer. <laughs> And then they're going to be back out at Flatiron Park where they are truly meant to be. That park was designed for concerts and movies and, you know, those smaller types of events and some big events. We can put 3,000 people out there according to the fire department, which I think we've come close to it. Yeah. Um, so we do ha we have a drive-in concert at the end of this month. So on the 24th, we have a drive-in concert, One Minute Millionaires. And then we have another drive-in concert in May. Again, we did a lot of, you do a lot of planning really early on. And as things change, you're going to stick it out. But we're, we're hoping to get back to our parks this summer. People want to sit in the grass, you know, and I don't blame them. Cool. Any other questions? Any more questions for Miss Jamie or Miss Liz? More? more? Oh. oh, more bags? Yeah, well, we just made those special for you guys. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you can go buy and pick them up. Pick up what we have extra. It is also online, so you can find it online. Our social media on Facebook, we're on Facebook and we're on Instagram. We're barely on Twitter, so I'd stick to Facebook and Instagram. Um, we're great. So if you're on either one of those, again, tooting my horn, but the staff that run it are amazing. It's up to date. We're constantly posting. We're constantly sharing updates about our department. Um, so I would recommend if you're, not, if you're one of those users, like us so you start to see that stuff in your feed. Okay. All right. I'm going to let the, so you'll introduce the library. Yes. They'll cut us down a little bit and put us in our <laughs> Liz and Jamie, <laughs> Parks and Recreation. I know, right? She's I'm, Leslie Nope. What do you what expect? Do want, what's next? Do you want me to do your presentation? They have books. They have books.
everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, um, from uh, fun in the park to fun in the library. Um, <clears throat> so in addition, of course, to our fabulous parks department, uh, we also have a library. Does everybody know where our library is? Good. You should know it is part of the Pinal County Library District. And uh, just within the last year, we have a new director. So this young lady here comes to us from the East Coast where she uh, did her studies in New York, worked in uh, North Carolina. Is that right? Um, before she came out to the Valley about, mm, let's see, 15 years ago, 20 years ago? I'm trying to do the math here. 20 years ago, started in Gilbert, worked in Gilbert for several years, um, and then came to us in, let's see, 2014? Does that sound about right? Um, so 23 years of library experience, uh, including six as the supervisory librarian uh, here in Apache Junction before she was named library director last year. Um, and it's just the second director in our history, right? It's pretty cool. Third? Third. Third. That's right. That's right. You're right. You're right. Third. The first Pam. <coughs> but uh, certainly uh, uh, has to follow in the footsteps of a longtime uh, library director. So um, she has taken over, and of course she took over in uh, one challenging time, to say the least, as you all know. Um, but that didn't come without meeting some of those challenges because we were one of the first to create a drive-through library, and we have continued to uh, be very, very uh, innovative in, in trying to serve our public as best we can um, in, our <coughs> excuse me, in our library services, and she'll tell you all about that. So, are you ready to go? Is yours up here too, or you have to plug it in? Okay, so the library director for the Apache Junction Public Library, Pam Harrison, there she is. Thank you very much. I'm not used to talking into these, so it's going to be a little weird. Plus, I'm only four foot eleven. <laughs> I'm next going to work on getting a video, because I am not a talker. So to follow a talker, this is going to be hard. I'm a librarian at heart, so we don't we don't usually talk that much. I, I was waiting for it. <laughs> oh, geez. Uh, there we go. Okay, so a little bit of history about the library that I think is very interesting, and I wasn't even aware of all of it. Um, but back in 64, the Women's Club, Women's Club Civic Council formed the Apache Junction Public Library Association, and they were very instrumental in founding our library, which came to being um, much later. They opened a room in what was uh, Superstition Plaza East, 575 West Apache Trail. I have no idea where that is. Does anybody know? The old Fry's parking lot. Oh, so it was off 2nd Avenue. Ah. We'll look at homework. We'll do homework. And then in 66, the library moved into the building at where you were talking about East 2nd Avenue. Um, land, materials, and building construction were all donated, and the building was part of a land exchange, exchange and demolished in 2016 to build the Fry's. Um, the library was donated in 1982 by the uh, AJPL Association to the city, and then the Friends was founded later that year. The library moved to the brand new building at where we currently are now, 1177 North I Idaho in July of 86. And in 95, we had our big East Wing edition, which is what most of you um, now would call the old library. Um, it, ex it included the children and teens areas, some study rooms and the computer lab. And then in 2008 um, is when the Mountain View expansion was done. And that included uh, remodeled the children's area, including the infamous castle, um, the family courtyard, which is an enclosed um, playground outside of the children's area, a new teen space that is totally closed off, and as um, our library manager, Tracy Curtis, would say, it's so we can see them and not smell them, <laughs> and additional square footage for materials and computers. So. Um, about four years ago, too, we did do another um, slight remodel. Our North Wing, which holds most of our nonfiction materials, was um, better utilized, so we have a, now a large program room in the back. So 
Um, for any of you that come to the Arizona Winter Lecture Series put on by the Humanities Council, now we can fit upwards of 100 people in that room sitting for a nice presentation. Um, and in the past, we used to have to do those in the Mountain View Room, which angered a lot of people because they were trying to study in the main part of the library. So that was a great addition that happened just a few years back. So the total square footage of the building right now is 31,545. We have over 100,000 items in our collection. And our circulations last year, and this is partly um, during COVID time, was 532, 732. I looked at the year before to see what circulations were then, and it was 596. So we were right on target. Um, but due to the pandemic, of course, there was a difference. And we averaged during our peak seasons, which um, for us is during the winter because of our seasonal visitors, um, over 1,000 people a day into the library. But in the summer, we also uh, tend to get those numbers as well because of our summer reading program, and I'll tell you about that in a little bit. And we offer over 1,300 programs a year. Um, this year, obviously, is a little bit different. We're doing some virtual programs, um, but we prefer to do them in person, and luckily, we are currently doing in-person programs, so we're proud for that. And all of our programs are free, so that is one thing that sets us a little apart from Parks and Rec. I know. Free is good. So this is our current location, our hours. We did expand our hours um, back in 2019. Uh, we were only open nine to five on Mondays and Wednesdays. We increased that to nine to eight. Um, open on uh, Saturdays and Fridays, nine to five, closed on Sundays. Our mission statement and vision, every library has a mission statement and vision. And of course, a mission for most libraries is that we wanna be a place for education, lifelong learning, entertainment, a place where people wanna come and gather. And the vision for us um, has always been to connect people, to foster creativity, to have lots of technology that people can learn um, and inspire personal growth. My personal vision coming into this position, um, now just at 13 months, is the connecting people portion of it. I um, unfortunately came in right when the pandemic started. My first day was March 26th. Uh, the, the library closed on March 18th for two days, and then we opened back up our drive through and I'll tell you about that in a few minutes. Um, so we haven't been able to really um, delve into that, uh, that vision yet of, of being more of a community partner, having more community engagement, being a lot more like Parks and Rec, where they go out and they partner with different organizations, um, they build relationships, um, have a hand in the civics of the, of the community. So that is something that hopefully once the pandemic um, is through, it's something that um, is on the top of my list to do. We normally have over 100 volunteers at one time at the library. We currently um, only have volunteers for our Friends of the Library bookstore. Our bookstore um, is at the west entrance of the library. It's called Chapter Two Bookstore. And they sell everything from, uh, I saw vinyl records in there today, uh, tons of DVDs, CDs, books, large print, kids books, teen books, anything you can think of that you would find at a, a used bookstore or at a library, we have, most of it is donations um, from the public and they sell them for astonishingly low prices, like a book for 75 cents. Um, people keep coming back, they find gems there. Um, they are currently looking for volunteers, so if you're interested in helping out with that bookstore, um, we just received a huge um, amount of donations, so much that they can't even fit them into the donation room to price them. So we have a backlog of them in our staff area, which is always a little challenging. Um, but once those go through, um, we, they need people to price the books, to check for condition, to run the bookstore, to shelve, to straighten. Um, they're a great group of, of people and they have a lot of fun doing it. Okay, so about your library card. One of the brochures you received from me, for, or from Tess, was um, what we call our general brochure. It has a picture of a girl on the front with a parrot. Um, that is just one of our designs that we use, and that is actually um, showing uh, one of our programs called Pause to Read, and that is where we have a 
nonprofit group called Pause to Read. Uh, they go to local libraries and bring out their therapy animals, and we're lucky enough that we get a therapy macaw. His name is Buddy. He's been coming to the library now for six years. He comes once a month every Saturday, and we also have a Great Dane that comes now. So they come from 2, third, no, two to 3.30 on Saturdays. Uh, the kids can come and uh, they take turns reading to the animals. It gives them a great um, place to not be judged by someone listening to every word they say. The bird actually sits in their lap and listens to them read the book and actually follows the pages. It's, it's phenomenal. So um, that's just one of the partnerships that we've embarked on over the years. But more about your library card. Does everybody here have one? And if you're embarrassed to say you don't, you're gonna to wanna to get one once we're done. So um, our library cards, yay! He's, uh, he's in the catalog. <laughs> Woo, there you go. There's always a few, ex so everyone that's in Apache Junction that lives in the city limits is um, able to get a free library card. Um, if they've already had one in the past, um, a lot of the people that haven't been to the library in quite a long time, their account might have got purged. So they can come back and, and we can check the system and try to get them a new card. Um, we also um, give cards to anyone that lives in Pinal County. So Florence, Casa Grande, any of those can come to our library. We are part of the Pinal County Library District. So we do um, share our collections. So if there is a book that you're looking for that we might not have available at our library or we don't own it, we can um, look to see if we can get it through our free courier service from one of our other branches. Um, anybody that owns business or is employed or has full-time students in the Apache Junction School District is um, eligible for a free card. And um, they are allowed to check out 20 items on each visit. We do have some restrictions on a couple of our different formats due to um, the number of items we have in that collection or the um, substantial cost of the item. We do, um, one of the things we do check out are what are called play away launch pads. They are actually actual tablets that have preloaded learning software um, apps on them for kids. Um, and they come in all different age ranges. So that is one item that we only allow um, one to be checked out in each card because we don't have um, thousands of them. Um, you can have up to 10 holds, so that means if the item is not available, you want to place a hold on it to get it um, as soon as, if it, as it's available. And we also do what's called interlibrary loans. Um, I used to work for another library system that did interlibrary loans, where, which is where you're getting a book from another library system, and it could be even in another state. And we used to charge $7 just to put in a request. And even if we couldn't get the item, they paid the $7. We do ours for free. And if, as far as I'm aware, I always have. So that is a really great thing that you can come in and request pretty much any book. And if we can get it from another library in the United States, um, it's a free service. Um, we have a, um, a few exceptions to our normal rules. Books check out for three weeks. We do have some bestsellers that only check out for seven days for um, a period of time until they're not brand new anymore. Um, entertainment, movies, video games. We have video games for all of the different platforms, PlayStation 2, 3, 4, 5, Xbox, Xbox One, Wii, Wii U, whatever else there is out there. Um, we have uh, no late fees. That's the biggest news. So yay. So back in July, um, we were able to get no library f uh, fines approved by the library board. And before that, we didn't um, have any youth fines. So that means any youth materials didn't have fines accrue on them. But now it's for everything that's in the library. And it's so great when people come in nowadays and they're, they come up to the desk and they have that look on their face. And they're like, hi, can I help you? Yeah, I'm bringing these back. They're like a week late, and they feel so bad. And I'm like, oh, well, we don't charge overdue fines anymore. And it's like, ah. Oh. So it's a great feeling to be able to say that. Um, also, with your library cards, you get two renewals that are done automatically for all of your items. So if you are a little late and no one has requested that material, um, your items will renew. So that um, originally was saving people um, a lot of money in case they did have uh, you know, one of those brain incidents where you forgot to bring back your materials. 
And then um, the best thing too about your library card is that you, a lot of people um, don't prefer to read paper materials anymore. They like to do everything online. Um, we are the only library in Pinal County. Oh, I take that back. We're one of two libraries in Pinal County that is part of the Greater Phoenix Digital Library. Um, and that's a consortium where we have access to tens of thousands of e-books, which are electronic books, e-audio books, which are electronic audio books that read to you, um, magazines, and it's the full, um, the full picture, the full color picture, the full magazines of um, all the popular magazines are out there, so you can forget about doing your magazine subscriptions anymore because you can get them all. Um, and some streaming videos. So we have a lot of different products that do that, and that'll be on a future slide. We also have um, in this bottom corner something that we've been offering since about 2019 as well is what's called an easy access card. And this is a program where we wanted to be able to um, allow people that didn't live in Pinal County um, some, some sort of access to the library. So they can come up with a, um, an ID from Mesa or an ID from um, out of state and they can still get a library card even if they're not a resident and they're allowed to check out three items at a time and also have full access to all the digital products. So um, it's been really great for a lot of people, and especially in Mesa and the near, nearby areas that um, during the pandemic, the Mesa libraries have been closed. They just recently um, opened very um, low capacity, but they've been able to come to us and be able to check out some items. So we've been happy to offer that program. And here's the library board. You might recognize a couple names on there. So this is an advisory board. Um, so they recommend policy for us. Um, they recommend improvements. Um, Pam back there is a big, is a, a new member, a new library board member, and she's, and she's great. She, uh, she keeps us on our toes and has us looking into new things to do every month. So um, we're grateful to have all those people on our board. And here's an awful picture of the four supervisors. I didn't say they looked awful. I just said it's an awful picture. So we've got Tracy Curtis on the left, Trish Pelletier, who's uh, been with the library now for over 30 years. And I think she normally is the one that comes in to do on um, these presentations. Uh, Penny Brumbaugh, she's new. She uh, came to us from Hawaii um, just last September. And that is me on the end, and that's enough of that picture. <laughs> So a couple perks with your library cards, and now all libraries have. One of them is a, the Media Bank. Media Bank is actually um, a DVD dispenser machine that's outside of our west entrance, and you use your library card to dispense movies out of it 24-7. So if you get out of work at 8 o'clock and we're closed, you can come to the west entrance. You do have to get up and walk up, walk up to it. It looks like an ATM machine. You scan your library card, you browse through the movies, you can choose up to five to check out, and they spit them out the machine at you. So it is a wonderful product, and I already got a question. Yes, Pam was mentioning that we, there is an online reservation system, so if you want to reserve the movies that you want to check out before you get there so you're not standing at the machine browsing, browsing, you can reserve your movies. It'll, I think it holds them for six hours, if I'm, if I'm correct. I think it's six. That's okay. And then you can come to the machine, scan your card, and it'll automatically dispense the DVDs for you. And there's DVDs and Blu-rays in that machine. And it's mostly the, the newer titles, the most popular. Um, we try to keep it fresh um, and, and replace things every so often. I did know that, but I forgot. We're one of the few in the United States. It actually is a product from Italy. So we're, we're pretty bougie here in Apache Junction. <laughs> um, we're also the only library in Pinal County to offer the Culture Pass program. And you have a brochure about that also that um, Tess handed out. So this is a great program that allows 
patrons just of Apache Junction Library to, to check out uh, free admission passes to different organizations and your brochure shows all of the ones that participate. Um, the nearest one is the Superstition Mountain Museum. Um, a lot of them are in the Phoenix area and there's even um, one that's in Mayer, Arizona, Arcosante, I think is in Mayer. Um, so there's some that are a little bit of a drive, but people um, love to come see what's available. You bring the pass up to the um, circulation desk, you check it out, you do have to go to the organization, the museum, um, within seven days of checking it out, the pass. Um, otherwise, it just expires and you can't use it. There's nothing to return. Um, and then after seven days, we put the pass back up for somebody else to enjoy. So it's a great program and we're really um, appreciate Act One for having it for such a long time. Events and programs. I don't have nearly as many pictures as Jamie did, but ours are in this century. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Max. <laughs> so the first one we're showing is Stuff a Plush. This was actually um, a, a program that we did just a couple months ago. It was one that I actually wanted to do like two years ago and it just never happened. And so uh, one of the youth people that is in the youth department now, she was like, oh, since you never did that program, I'm gonna do it now. And I'm like, great. So it's, um, they got to, uh, we bought the skins, what they call the skins uh, of the stuffed animals and then the kids got to pick which one they wanted, and then they got to stuff them with the, with the foamy, fluffy stuff, whatever it is. But of course, that wasn't the whole program. There was a, we always try to have a literacy component to all of our programs. So before that, we read, um, she read a picture book about a child that got his first stuffed animal, and I think he lost it. Um, so that was a really um, popular program. That one, um, we, did, we do do registration for some of our programs because of limited supplies, and that was one of them that we had to do that. Plus, it was also during, during COVID, so we had to keep the numbers at a minimum. Um, Art in the Library is a program that's been going on for I don't know how long, longer than I've been there, and it's, a, it's a very well attended. It's a, usually a, a group of um, men and women that come in, and they use our room and make beautiful pieces of art for about between three to six hours during the day. They want to stay longer, um, but we have to keep them at a, uh, at a reasonable time. Um, we also have other programs that have been around for a long time for adults, including um, the Crochet Club that meets every Saturday. Um, we have three book clubs, a mystery book club, a nonfiction book club, and a classic book club. Um, so lots of things for adults to do. The Winter Lecture Series, as I mentioned earlier, was uh, probably our most popular adult program. Um, that is the one where they watch the, um, the lectures in person most years. This year it was virtual. So um, this year was kind of nice. We got a ton of people, but it was because it was open to everybody in the whole state. So um, we, we do a lot of programs for adults. There's Paws to Read and Buddy again. He's very, very photogenic. And then we also have lots of teen events. Um, they meet, they have um, every third Tuesday of the month, they have their own event and they get to choose what they wanna do each month. And it's for ages 12 to 17. Um, they always have food and it usually involves music. So, but not always. So this is them at one of their events in the, that North Wing program room that was newly constructed. So new ways we're engaging our community. Um, the, the picture on the top left is of our bookmobile. Yes, it looks dirty, but it's not dirty. It is sun-baked, like major sun-baked. It, it, it looks like they've been in a, a horrendous fire. So we are looking at getting um, a new wrap on our vehicle. We're hoping that's gonna um, be coming up next year. Um, originally, that vehicle was purchased for our grant program called the Fun Van, which is um, supported by First Things First, which is the early childhood initiative for the state of Arizona and paid by tobacco tax. Um, we've had the Fun Van program for 11 years now, and I don't think anyone expected it to be 
um, such a long-standing program, but it's turned out to be so wonderful, and we have such great parent educators that they keep renewing our contract with them every year. So what the fund van does is they go out to different locations across Pinal County, including the Auction Indian, Indian Reservation, and they teach parenting classes. Parents get to come with their kids, ages birth to five, and they learn parenting skills and literacy skills, and the kids get a free book at every class. Uh, they get to play with each other and socialize. Um, they get to do arts and crafts. They sing songs. They read books. It's a great program, so we're really happy that we still have that. Um, we have stolen the van, though. They're no longer using the bookmobile, so we have now turned it into what we're calling the mobile library. And um, we've been going to mainly um, some community events and also some school events. Um, our most popular ones have been the ones where they were giving out the, the free, uh, the drive through food at the schools for a while. We would have the bookmobile park there and people could stop and we had a selection of books for them to check out or they could renew their library card or check out a library card. We also have um, now library um, Wi-Fi hotspots that can be checked out and that's been very popular. We got that through a grant through the, library, uh, the state library um, and the bookmobile itself is a hotspot. So, um, we're hoping to expand upon this program a lot more, um, but it's been really nice to have it so we could go out and do some events. We did the first Fridays the last couple of months and met some new people, signed people up for library cards, and the staff love to go because they get to eat junk food, so it works out for everybody. Um, Books by Mail um, actually was a program that came just in time. Um, it happened right before COVID happened. So it's a program where um, people that are homebound can get some books sent to their house for free using their library card. Um, they have a form they fill out. They can even write down what genres or what authors they're interested in. We match them up with some different titles that we think they'd like. They get mailed to their house for free. And when they're done, there is a return bag that they just stick in the mailbox and it comes back to us. Um, it's been a little slow going with the program and I think part of it's our fault for not promoting it more than we should. But if you know anybody that's homebound or, and can't make it to the library and needs books, um, we do send out large print, large print books to them. And lastly on this slide, the drive up and the walk up windows. So um, in 2008 when they were doing the um, expansion of the library, uh, the drive-up window was, um, was incorporated into the, to the design, but you also know that was the year of the economic downturn. So the drive-up window never became what it was supposed to be, which was a drive-up window. It did have chutes on the outside where people could return their items, um, but there was never a person there to actually do any transactions. So when COVID hit, um, we worked diligently to get that to be a drive-up window. Um, it did have a sliding window, which we, um, we got changed into a drawer, so we can put items in the drawer, kind of like when you're going to the pharmacy, um, so they can put their items in the drawer, we bring them back in, so it's totally contactless. Um, and it's been very, very popular, um, especially during the pandemic. But we continue to, um, we're gonna continue to use it and we hope to increase the number of services we do there. Because currently we, um, we let people pick up their holds and uh, return materials and renew library cards. But we do wanna offer maybe some other services there like photocopying and just quick things that they could do through the window. The walk-up window I don't have a picture of, but it's on the west side of the building um, to the left of the doors. And it was, um, it's a, it's a, it's a stainless steel door. You can ring a doorbell on the outside of it, just like at the drive-up window, and somebody will talk to you, and you can actually do your transaction through that drawer instead of if you don't have a car to go through the drive-up. Um, not as well used, probably because you have to get out of your car. Some people might not notice it's there, but the. Um, it's a good thing to have there because in the future, if we are able to expand our library walls out a little bit, it could be um, a twenty. It could be part of like a twenty-four-seven or a before-after after hours types of service that we could do um, securely through that window. 
And here's the digital services, uh, Greater Phoenix Digital Library, also known as Overdrive. Their app is called Libby. Um, that's the e-books, e-audiobooks, magazines, and videos. They have it all. Freegal is your free music connection. You get six free music downloads every week. You just, if, you don't, if you don't download them, you lose them, but you get six more in the next week. I get a notification on my phone every week. You have six downloads available. And they have every genre of music you can think of, um, and you get to keep them forever. It's not something that gets checked back in. They're songs you get to keep. The cloud library is uh, mainly ebooks and some e audiobooks. Hoopla is made more for, um, I, I think of that one as being the one that's most for kids. They have a great kids um, collection of, of books and um, videos, and they have their own kids zone. Um, so that one's uh, a really fun one to look at. We do have a couple specialty areas in the library, one of them being um, what we call the creation zone. Um, it used to be in the room next to the circulation desk, but we have recently moved it into a bigger room um, in the back of the Mountain View room. And in that room, we have a 3D printer, a digitization station, which can actually digitize, digitize excuse me, um, VHS to disc and MP3 to MP4. I, I probably have that wrong, but you, it, it can do music and it can do, um, it can do audio and it can do video. Um, the virtual reality, we have virtual reality goggles. We've done some events with those before so people could see what it's like to, to be in another reality. So we have free Wi-Fi throughout the building um, without any um, login. We have approximately 45 computers. We have a printer and copier, wireless printing, a microfilm scanner and reader, and we do have um, almost all of the Apache Junction news already digitized from uh, microfilm. Uh, document scanner, a faxing service, so we do offer free outgoing faxes, which is very popular once people find out how much it is over at uh, Office Max, thank you. I was gonna say Kinko's. One of those. Yeah. And then one on one tech assistance, which we are, have on pause at the moment. Um, that is where you can make an appointment, or if we have somebody available, they can sit down with you for a, up to an hour and teach you whatever you need to know about your digital device, whether it be your smartphone, your tablet, or if you're having a problem. Um, so that is currently on pause. And then we also have the audio video studio. Um, this is still in the making. We have most of the products that we're going to offer in it. Um, a lot of it was purchased through grants um, that we had with um, econ the um, Economic Development Department. Um, they did programs a few years ago for entrepreneurs, um, and it was a partnership with the library, so we got some grant funds from them so that we could purchase some iPads, some really professional cameras that have 4K capability, professional lighting, a green screen, um, and a lot of other technology in there. We um, are working on getting the process together of how we're going to schedule that room and what kind of training we're gonna provide for people that wanna use it. Um, it has been used a little bit, um, mainly by our police department, <laughs> so they can do videos, but um, we're hoping to have that open to the public real soon. Real soon. And we also, um, I don't have a picture of it, but we do have a study room now that is reservable, and that is new for us um, since I've been there. We have not had a, um, a reservable study room space. So that is um, something that can be reserved through our website, or you can call or come on to the circulation desk, and we can get you signed up for that. Who, who has questions? So the question's about the 3D printer, and since the prints, the molds take a long time to print, how does it work with scheduling the room and actually getting the final result? Is that, okay. So um, 
outside of the pandemic, we would normally make an appointment. We would, we would teach you the machine, train you on the machine, um, and have you sign off on a waiver, uh, an agreement. And then once that is done, um, you would start your print. And if it's a large object that is gonna take several hours, we make sure that nobody is scheduled to use the printer for that time. If it's gonna go um, beyond when we're open or, or later in the evening, we just have you come back at a later time to pick it up. Is there a fee for using the 3D printer? There's no fee for using it. If um, whatever you, Whatever your product is that you print, it is um, charged at five cents per gram. Um, and since the uh, filament is very light, even after printed, um, most things cost under a dollar that, that most people print. And we've seen some really practical things printed on there, and then we've also seen like you know, Darth Vader and <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> yes, sir. So you were signing up for a library card on our website. Right. And then the barcode. The P-A-C-R-E-G. Yeah. Yes. So they do still need to check your ID. Okay. So you would need to either come into the library or give us a call to arrange a time like you would come up, to, if you didn't want to come in, you could come up to the drive up window, show your ID, we'd have your card waiting for you there. We just have to verify your account information. And I didn't also um, mention that cards do expire on an annual basis. That always throws everybody for a loop. They're like, I can't get in. What is wrong? It says I have blocks. Uh, it's usually because we have to renew your card and it takes about three seconds. I'm sorry. Oh, it, see, you got the email. Yes, we have notifications for everything. And we do have an online renewal system. So if nothing has changed on your account, you can submit your information through there and we ask that you give us 48 hours to complete the renewal. Yes, Pam. Thank you, Wowbury. Um, we do have an app, it's the Pinal County Library District app, so that's for all the libraries, um, but of course you can whittle it down to just us. And besides that, we have a brand new newsletter, it comes out weekly, it's called Wowbury, it is specific to our library, and if you sign up with your email address, you can sign up on our website, um, I think there's a link also in your brochure. Once a week on Wednesday morning, you will get an, an email with full color pictures of all the new items we have received in the past week. You can click on things, place holds, um, and so forth. And it also has a link to our monthly calendar. I probably will get in trouble. I've always been told, don't tell anybody about the owls because they're afraid for their safety. But everybody knows there's owls at the library. And right now, um, there's two babies, and they're in, last week they were this big. Today, I took a picture, and they're like this big. Yeah, they're, so they're getting ready to go. Any more questions? Yes. For the copier, if we, for the copier, if we wanted to use cardstock rather than regular paper, can we bring in our own cardstock? No, we can't allow that, unfortunately. Is there cardstock available? <laughs> For you to do what with? The copy. <laughs> we just can't put cardstock in the in the copier, period. Okay. Yeah, because a lot of the times it gets jammed. That's okay. Yeah, but it's a good question. If you talk to me, I might be able to hook you up. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> now everyone's you're, gonna you're be, over two, Pam. You, I know. you talked about the owls and now the cop. I'm gonna be getting all sorts of phone calls tomorrow. Pam, you got somebody at the desk. Is the mystery room open back up yet? It is open for browsing. It is not open for seating. I know. I have a supervisor's meeting tomorrow, and it is one of the things to discuss on the agenda. So, yeah, I'm I'm hoping that we're gonna start offering a little bit more seating. We have quite a bit compared to all the other libraries in the, in the valley. Um, some of them are still closed, but we've been open since June 1st. 
um, limited capacity, um, but I'm really proud that we've been able to keep trucking on. Again, kidding. see, we're giving all the all the I secrets know. away. Pam, we're not going to tell you anything anymore. <laughs> we're not going to give away any more secrets. It's eight o'clock. I think I think Al's getting <laughs> hungry. <laughs> <laughs> it's time. Yeah, I still got a little bit to go. Not too much more. No, any more questions? We're okay. We're okay on time. Don't worry. Everybody's okay. everybody's used to being here very late. The more I do these, the more I'm going to be like Jamie. So I'm just going to take <laughs> me a couple of years. If you mention this, I didn't hear it, but you want my what I like to always let people know about is our Arizona room. Oh yes, so many things to add to the PowerPoint or to the video. If I can get somebody to make a video for me. Um, yes, we have what's called the Arizona Room, and as you would expect, it has everything Arizona in it. Um, there are some very rare um, books in there that we have locked up in a case that you can ask to um, look at while you're in the library. We hold on to ID for those, um, and then we also have some that circulate. So everything from things to do in Arizona to history to art. Um, just a little bit of everything, and a lot of it's out of print, so it's a it's a prized collection of Arizona items. Okay. Anything more? Pam Harrison, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. As long as everybody's okay. Okay. Yeah, so there should be everybody should have two pages. Okay, we're going to finish up um, with um, yeah, there should be two pages. Everybody should have two pages. One is uh, um, the Senate and U.S. Uh, House of Representatives, and then the other is the state. Governor, state legislators. No, you, you pick up one because I started one on one side and one on the other and then they're going to cross over. I'm trying to be confusing. I'm trying to confuse everybody and nobody's going along with it. <laughs> yeah, I know. I didn't have time to staple it. That's a good point. <clears throat> I, I, I actually, actually, I was going to have everybody come up and get it. I was going to be worse. Uh, the library probably does have an amazing stapler, but but are you allowed to use it is a whole other story. If I have a library card, <laughs> um, usually uh, on one of these nights, if not the last night or one of the last nights, I always try to remind everybody it's a really good idea uh, if you haven't already um, to know who your representatives are. And we have representatives, of course, at every level of government. And so what I have handed out to you are all your representatives, if you uh, live in the city of Apache Junction, or at least pretty close uh, thereof, um, starting with, of course, the two sta um, uh, senators, U.S. senators from Arizona, um, uh, the U.S. House of Representative uh, Congress person for our area, Congressional District Four, right? Wow, I, uh, I lost there for a second. Um, and then from the state uh, level, of course, the, uh, the governor's office um, uh, is listed on the second page, along with the three uh, state 
um, representatives that you have at the State House, one senator and two representatives. Uh, if you're not familiar uh, with how our bicameral system works. Uh, we also, of course, have a county supervisor and then the seven member mayor and council for the city. And so what I always tell everybody when you are uh, looking at that is this is a great place to start. This is called USA.gov and USA.gov is literally the first place to go if you have no idea where you are or where you live or who represents you and what level of government it might be, this is a great place to start because it has just about everything you could imagine there. Um, like I said, I gave you ones for your particular area. If you do not live in a city or you live at least a little bit outside of the city um, or plan to move, God forbid, outside the city, um, this would be a good place for you to go and try to see who your representative might be outside of that. Um, like I said, it's just a really good idea to know who uh, represents you in any number of ways, whether we're talking about uh, a state uh, a bill that's before the state legislature that might ha be of interest uh, to us, um, something that is happening at the congressional level that might be of, uh, of interest, then you know who to contact uh, for any number of things. And remember that all of them have uh, different um, sort of responsibilities as far as the jurisdictions go. So. One of the uh, ones that we uh, have just very recently reached, reached out to is Congressman Gosar's office because there is at least one proposal out um, to consolidate Social Security offices across the land, including, of course, in Arizona, and one of the ideas is to close the Social Security office right here on Superstition and, and consolidate everything to their office in Gilbert. So we have petitioned uh, Congressman uh, Gosar and his office and, and hopefully it will go up and of course the Senator's office as well, hopefully it will go up the, uh, the federal chain and uh, they will see fit to rethink that particular uh, decision. I, I don't think it's final by any means, I think it's still quite a ways out, but we'll see how that goes. So like I said, good information to have and very important um, all the way around. Um, with that, we are going to end a little early, and I will explain real quickly why there would have been a third, and we may still get this third uh, presentation in, hopefully that, that last week. Um, so uh, scheduled for tonight, had been scheduled for tonight, was a representative from the Apache Junction Unified School District. Um, they're obviously in transition. If you're not aware, uh, they have uh, uh, agreed with their superintendent to, to mutually uh, separate, and so they're going to be in the process of finding a new superintendent. So, But I am going to try to get uh, a, another representative uh, from the school district to come to that last uh, meeting. If not, we'll, we'll do a, a quick overview of the school district, which, of course, is a very, very important part of this city, um, even if it's not part of the city proper, like it is in other places. Uh, Los Angeles is a good example. The city of Los Angeles actually does oversee the school district uh, there. Um, here they're completely separate and they're, it's a completely separate jurisdiction uh, and completely separate boards and governing and everything like that. So it's got a little different um, situation going on there too. So we will uh, hopefully be able to cover that uh, in a couple of weeks. Okay, any other questions up to this point? Otherwise, I'm going to let you all go. Pat. Okay, so you know you talked about another part of the budget, So So, for those of you who are unaware, this, this is the city website. The city website's uh, address has actually changed, um, although if you go to the old address, it still gets there. But the new um, city address is, goes along with the convention of other cities, uh, certainly in Arizona, which is the city name az.gov. So we are now Apache Junction az.gov. So that's what the uh, homepage looks like. It's a little off there. Um, but this is the... Uh, the city's homepage, this is where you can find everything you need to know about city business, city processes. Um, if you're not sure where to look, we have a great search engine right on the top. But if you're just looking for, you know, um, wanting to apply for a job, there's boards and commissions for you, Pam. Um, 
read the city code, visit the library, any number of things, find a, you know, find a department. You can also go to government, list all the, the uh, departments that way. If you're a business, this you know, gives you an idea of how to, how to start a business or take over a business in the city. If you're coming here to have a little bit of fun but you're not from here, um, uh, here's our visitors page, and then the community in general will talk about other stuff that's going on in the city proper uh, and where to find it. But like I said, if you're looking for something in particular, um, uh, we were talking, I think, that night about the maps that are available <coughs> Excuse me, um, uh, on the we city website, and that is uh, what GIS is. So you could just put in GIS and then you get to this page. This has a really cool um, map that will tell you all the cool things being built in the city. Uh, if you just wait a second, it'll show it to you. So we are, so everybody knows the triangle. You know, we're right here. And this, you know, you know shows you some of the things that are, that are out and about um, developments, housing, uh, business, retail, things like that, that we're working on. And um, Popeyes is still there listed, but I have not heard if that's, I think that was still 50-50 or something like that. I don't think it's a done deal by any means. <laughs> there, there you go. See, no information available, sorry. Yeah, I know that they had been in, in, in discussions uh, to go on essentially where the, where the gas station was at, fr at the Old Fries. That's where it was going to go. I, I, think, I don't think it's done, done one way or the other. I don't think it's gone away, but I don't, I don't think it's been finalized by any means. So that's the only other thing that's coming that's not quite on there is Barrow's Pizza over next to the Fries. Um, it's a couple down from the Fries. It's actually next to the little medical office and next to Subway. <coughs> um, we stopped by there this morning, actually. They're shooting for May to open. Teradiddle's just opened, correct. Um, uh, soft opening on Thursday or Friday or wherever. And they're, just, uh, and they're just off and running. That is the old Cowboys Up right across the street from Flat Iron Park. No, we do not know what's coming in Village Inn. I don't know if anybody asks about that. That's still very much in play. Any other empty ones that we're thinking about? Yeah. You do take notes. So what Pat is asking for those of you online is that we were referring to this particular website, which is mygovernmentonline.org, and that's another uh, sort of warehouse uh, database of, of different things, all things governmental, um, where you can find you know different information. So there's planning and zoning that we're probably talking about, permitting, licensing, things like that. Um. Uh, Luckily, all you have to do is type in parks, and there is Miss Liz right there. Oh, Miss Liz. <clears throat> Actually, you can do ajpl.org. Oh, but you know what? Okay, but, but no picture of Pam. No picture of Pam. Okay, we're, we're going to change that tomorrow. But you gotta love the owl. You gotta love the owl. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. You're not supposed to know about the owl. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Anybody else looking for anything else while we're up here? Um, so, anyway, <clears throat> for those of you who are, like I said, are looking for. Uh, information about the city in particular, that's probably the best place to go is to the city website. You can find all of this stuff. You just have to put it in the search engine or you can find it through one of the drop down menus. It's real easy to find. Um, and like I said, um, uh, if you have any other questions about your representatives or is somebody there you're missing or you're not sure about, 
um, please let me know. Says uh, I like to to try to make that as complete as possible as the, as the way it goes. Okay, we have one more meeting to go. One more uh, session class uh, two weeks from now on the 28th, and we will wrap everything up as best we can and try to um, uh, tie up a few loose ends and answer all the questions that have been sitting out there. Um, and then, uh, like I said, we'll um, um, try to schedule, tentatively schedule our, our graduation night uh, as well, and so we'll get that all done then. All right, any other last minute comments or questions or anything along those lines? All good? Tess? Well, that doesn't do anybody any good online, Tess. <laughs> anybody online needs Tess's number, we'll get it to you. All right. If there is no other um, uh, questions of any sort, I will wish you all a very pleasant good night. And as always, please drive home safely.